Okay, thanks everybody for, uh, for coming out. Um, if any of you saw me talk at uh, PEcon a year ago, um, I apologize, half of the talk was that talk. Um, but the other half isn't. This is, uh, this is Postgis, uh, so you know, like this is Spinal Tap. Um, so it naturally it goes to 11, um, but not right now. Um, right now Postgis only goes to two. So I'm gonna be doing examples and talking about things that exist in Postgis 2.0. I'm starting to jettison my history. I'm forgetting all the stuff that existed prior to, prior to April. Um, so Postgis 2.0 came out this spring. So I'd like to start off with an appeal to the, the relevance of a stable database, why we care about these things. Um, that's actually easier now than it was 10 years ago uh, when Postgis was started because location, it's in our faces all the time, right? We're carrying around sensors, um, they have embedded GPS chips and radio transmitters that are in our pockets. And, and by their very functioning, they necessarily always know exactly where we are in the world. Um, so, so that's relatively new. Like GPS smartphones have only been with us for five years or so. Um, let's just say it's still an internet eternity. But, uh, but in fact, it's easy to forget that the non-specialist interest in geospatial objects kind of dates back only to about 2005. Um, so that's when O'Reilly ran the first WARE 2.0 conference. But it wasn't the conference that sparked the interest. Uh, the interest exploded a few months before, because 2005 is the watershed year in mass market mapping. It's when Google Maps was released. Um, and where 2.0 was actually a response. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't there. They just sort of threw it like six months later. Ah, oh, this is really interesting. Need to throw a conference about that. It was a response to the huge interest that was generated by Google Maps and then the API, which they released later. And so suddenly location was a huge mass IT interest, and folks who'd never thought about location before started thinking about it. Now everyone now had the ability to put data on a map, and when everyone can do something that follows it, everyone naturally must use that, that thing. Um, and so the use of location is now seen as, a, as like a critical place of competition for a technology giant. So all the major players, they've rolled out maps or location APIs. So Google was the first one, but then Yahoo came along. Um, Facebook added the idea of places and check-ins. Twitter, of course, has location attached to tweets. Microsoft rolled out Bing, um, and then Startups, you know, pure play location startups like Foursquare started coming along. Uh, actually, most recently, Amazon now has their own Maps API. Everyone's got a Maps API. Um, but before you can put things on a map, right, you need to know where those things are. And, and nowadays, we know where a lot of things are instantly and all the time, right? Um, your laptop, you know where it is. Uh, you know where you have it. You know where the guy who stole it has it. Um, if you're looking for houses, the databases already know where the houses are and they can tell you about them and where they are. If you're looking for a terrorist mastermind, you can find him through satellites looking down from above. Um, and of course yourself, because you're walking around with a GPS in your pocket. Uh, we're willfully carrying around location sensors all the time and we're walking in front of sensors all the time, right? We can walk in front of a bank machine and see if you are, okay, we know you are. You were at that bank machine at three o'clock. Um, so we're swimming in an ocean of location information now. Um, but not very long ago, all that location information, um, right now it's really cheap, it's all over the place, we're, we're drowning in it. 10 years ago, it was expensive, it was hard to get, it was hard to use, it was hard to, hard to display. Um, those are the days when we talked about not location, but about GIS. Um, and that's kind of where post just comes from. Post, post is a fun name, right? It started out as a simple sound play, PostSQL, uh, transformed to PostGIS. And that incorporates GIS, um, which is what we were aiming for. Uh, but what's, what's this GIS I'm talking about? Um, it's, just a, it's just a boring acronym, uh, Geographic Information System. But, but GIS is a function, it's, it's something you do. It's not a technology thing, it's a process, and it's been done for a long time, it's uh, conceptualized. So the classic example of GIS is to ask someone, what's GIS? And you say, oh well, uh, once upon a time, uh, in 1884, or 1864, there's a cholera outbreak uh, in central London around Broad Street. And uh, John Snow, he was a doctor and he was a skeptic of what was currently the, the default theory of disease, the ill humor theory, you smell bad things and you get sick. Um, he thought that the disease might be waterborne, but he had to prove it somehow to the, uh, to the establishment. So he started out with a street map um, during this cholera outbreak and he put a black bar on his street map next to uh, every address that had a cholera death build them all in, you know, and then you look at the whole map of London, and you present an overview, and the evidence is pretty convincing, right? This is not something which is a broad-based epidemic. In fact, it's quite localized. 
and it really is centered in one place. The, the place was the broad street, broad street pump. And using this map, you convince the authorities to remove the pump handle, and the epidemic promptly went away. So it kind of proved that uh, cholera was waterborne, not airborne. So in GIS, a map provides context, uh, but the item of interest is often something else laid on top, like a wet snow chase in the cholera incident. And the analysis can be uh, visual, like that looking at the map, or it can be calculation-based. Um, so in the late 60s and 70s, the item of interest to governments was soil. Governments worried about uh, country's farming crisis. They want to know what the soil capability was across uh, the whole country. Um, so they, they've done aerial photography, they've done resource inventory, they've generated lots of data about soil through the analysis. You know, what is the overall situation of soils across the country with manual and flow. So in 1968, Roger Tomlinson, uh, who's now known as the father of GIS, he convinced the government of Canada to try using computers. So he digitized maps of Canada using a drum scanner. Um, and using those digitized maps, he could provide the first ever country scale analysis of land inventory. And Tomlinson's work became known as the Canada Land Inventory. It was really the first GIS. So it's uh, another thing, maybe we should do a song about this. We invented GIS. Ha ha. Um, it's really cool to look at this video clip uh, from the National Film Board of Canada documentary uh, called Data for Decision. It's, it's awesome. They got uh, sound tracks that go boop, 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 boop. And, uh, and they show like the drum scanners and all the amazing technology uh, of the era. It's, it's, it's mind blowing stuff. Um, so once you have your map data in a computer, you can do all sorts of fun analysis with it. Um, so this is a transportation cost service. They're moving timber from a cut block to a mill. So the red areas are places where it's a high cost to, to move timber. And then the deep areas are the places that are far from roads. Uh, you can build heat maps by aggregating point data. In this case, it's uh, aggregating concentrations of people. You show a visual display. Um, you take a planar space and you segment it with a partitioning algorithm. So starting just with the points that are checked for cities, you can create a bunch of areas that are trade areas by breaking up these into equal polygons to break up the area. Um, or you can calculate trade areas. So given a store and a road network, figure out the areas that are served by that store, usually defined in terms of drive time. So that's a, a network analysis driving out from the stores along networks to get a maximum drive time. Or most commonly, you can just print out color for pictures. Um, you know, who won, who won the election in 2008? Can you tell from the colors? Uh, that, that's a fluoroplex map waiting for that. Uh, fluoroplex maps can be very misleading, fluoroplex maps of population in particular, uh, which is why there's a classic book of about GIS, um, God, what's it called? How to Lie with Maps, um, how you present things can be a very, very powerful, uh, very, very powerful tool. So anyway, so GIS world view of the world is that what you can do is you can look at reality and you can decompose it into a series of logical layers uh, that you can then recombine to answer questions. So, so here's a, an example of a GIS use case, a GIS workflow. Um, given the question, where is a good place to, for residential development um, using some toy data and rules? And let's use rules of a good place would be a, an air, a place with an area of 50 hectares or larger. Um, a good place would be more than 50 meters from lakes and streams, so they don't pollute the, uh, the water. Um, place that's not already developed, clearly. We don't want to go somewhere that already has something. Um, and we're only allowed to develop new things that on green fields in this case, so forests and pastures and, and undeveloped land. And we're not going to do any develop, development on the side of hills um, to keep things cheap. So start with a land use map, right? And then uh, strip away all the inappropriate uses. So none of the roads, none of the things that have already been developed. Uh, now look at the places that are 50 meters or more away from water. Take a look at the elevation data and mask it out. Calculate the slope of each grid shelf and the elevation. Gives you a funny picture like that. And then mask out the areas that where the slope is too high, so the rest of it's just nothing flat. And then finally, you combine the three maps. So we've got suitable slope um, far away from water, suitable land use, and you get this map of all the places that might be good. But we need places that are big enough for our development, so we need to um, take all these individual small places and measure their area, find the small ones and the big ones, and then just throw away all the small ones. And you're left with the places that are suitable for development, or the places that are poorly developed. At the end of the day, you produce little composited maps, like the base map with the 50 areas on top, and that's, that's your deliverable. So until recently, that kind of analysis was done exclusively with GIS software, very specialized stuff. It had its own data formats, um, very proprietary tools. And the GIS community has built up around those tools. They have 
an interesting view of their place in the world. Um, so here's a sort of enterprise diagram that a GIS person drew. And you see all the databases around the edge and the GIS software in the middle. And the most important thing is the map. In fact, it gets even better, right? The most important thing is the map. Location is the only thing. Um, it's a thing, um, but it turns out, and we know this because we're database people naturally, that the cylinders go in the middle. Um, <laughs> they're not the size. The cylinders go in the middle. That's the important thing. So as database people, we can say, you know, I like this idea that you can take the world and decompose it into logical layers and model it that way. That's, that's a neat way to think about the world and to model things. But your system's architecture is insane, right? The GIS doesn't go in the middle. The database goes in the middle. Um, but what we can do is we can take your layer idea and, uh, like, this is, this is crazy. We can take your layer model and we can decompose it a little more, right? So take your parcel layer, parcels layer, for example, right? Each parcel has some information about it that fits in a database row, right? So we can put each parcel shape into the row, too. Um, that's pretty good, right? So for each parcel, we've got an attribute and we've got a shape. But then we can, we can pivot it, right? Flip it around and actually represent the whole layer as a single, single table. So we've got this nice sort of homeomorphism. What GIS people call the layer, we call a table. Um, that's a nice idea, but is it practically possible, right? Can database software handle this use case? Um, it can, uh, but we need a database capable of a few things. Um, it needs to be able to support non-standard types. Uh, it needs to be able to handle pretty large objects in its rows. Uh, it needs to be able to efficiently index those objects in, uh, in the Cartesian plane, at least, and preferably in, in, the, in the volumetric space, or maybe in a, an n-dimensional space. And, uh, and we need to be able to provide functions that work against those non-standard types. So can anyone think of a database that can do all those things? Yes. Um, you know, Postgres was designed for custom type extension right from the start. Right? If you read Stonebreaker's paper, which he wrote before Postgres was even written, he said, okay, I'm going to make a new database now. Ingress is fun. I'm going to make a new one now, and it's going to have the following capabilities. And one of the capabilities that's in that paper is it's got to support runtime extensions. So right from the start, Postgres supported a runtime extension. Um, and from version 7.1 and up, it's been able to transparently handle um, large rows. Which, you know, you might say, what? What do you need large rows for? We're working with GIS objects. Um, and Postgres has a max page size of 8K by default. You can make it larger, but there's trade-offs for that. Um, surely 8K is big enough? Not necessarily. So given 8K, uh, and given the idea that a coordinate sort of involves two or two doubles, uh, you're looking at 16 bytes per double, which means you can only do 512 coordinates, 512 coordinates per object. Uh, it turns out that objects larger than that are really common. Um, this is a, a very coarse, from a very coarse world map. Um, Canada is 3,000. Um, even the continental US, United States, 1,380. So you really need to be able to have a database that supports um, arbitrarily large objects and rows. So there's actually another meaning, I think, to Postgres. And this plays in almost exactly to, uh, to the keynote today. Um, it's not just a sound play on PostgreSQL, it's also a historical statement. Um, Postmodernism, PostSQL, um, PostGIS is what comes after traditional GIS. PostGIS after traditional GIS is not just temporally, but in terms of how you think about doing GIS. Because it's no longer something you do with GIS software. Um, and it's no longer something that only the GIS people do. It's anyone who can work a database can do things that used to be done exclusively by a GIS department. So, uh, so they can answer questions that used to require specialized GIS software. You know, there's an emergency. We need to contact everyone within 5,000 meters of the reactor. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, and you can do that in SQL and not even very complex SQL, right? That's really brain dead simple SQL. Um, sticking a GPS on, uh, on all the buses in your school bus to, you know, ask a question. Does bus number 12 need maintenance? Well, how do we know? How far did it travel last week? Easy to answer that sort of SQL. One SQL statement in your SQL database. Very, very powerful. Uh, more powerful, really, in terms of desktop GIS, both in terms of the amount of code required and the fact that because the logic is running inside this very standard tool, it's easy to hook it into larger systems um, using very ordinary programming tools that as database people we're used to, but GIS people might find a bit uh, arcane. So 
those are the kinds of questions you can ask you using Postman, questions that previously required custom language using GIS tools. Now we can ask them using standard features. So a bit of history. Uh, Postman came into being in 2001, so it's a shade over 10 years old. Uh, I'm in a Victoria consulting company called Distraction Research. You can see me in that picture. Uh, the first revision wasn't actually by me. It was by the guy to my right, um, Dave Blasby, and he worked on it till 2004. Uh, and then a fellow named Sandro Santilli until 2006, although actually he's come back to the project uh, a year ago, but he's worked with me. And I've been doing a lot of the development since 2008. Um, in PostgreSQL, Postman's geometry, uh, it's nothing special. It's just a variable length type. That's the type declaration there. Um, because it's a variable length type, uh, it's internal structure looks a lot like a string, so it starts off with a standard um, bare header. Um, and then we pack a bunch of standard header stuff on to the top of it. So everything to the to the bounding box is, or to the type number, is the same across all the uh, all the geometry types. So the SGRID is the spatial reference ID identifier. Every geometry needs to know it's an app projection. Uh, there's a, a byte of flags, which tells us things like uh, what the dimensionality of the, of the geometry is. Uh, we can do two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional geometry. Uh, and then we have the bounding box, which is important for indexing purposes. We keep that serialized in front of the object so we can pull off the bounds very, very quickly without having to necessarily scan the whole object. And bear in mind, the object can be really large. So there's a 2,000, 3,000 word document, and we had to scan them every time we wanted to box. That would be really expensive. So that's kind of uh, deep, dark voodoo. You never see that um, as a user, but as a programmer, that's, that's how we set up the underlying storage type. And we also set up that with Postman 2, um, we set up the structure so that the double four bits ended up being aligned. So we can actually now do align directly to object, which we couldn't do in, in the previous version. Um, on top of that storage, we need to build functions. And rather than writing all the algorithms ourselves, we have built Postgres against a number of third-party GIS libraries. These are open source libraries, um, so we can avoid reinventing wheels. So Postgres provides us the storage place to hold all this stuff and all the smarts about things like uh, transactions and so on. Postgres does Postgres provides that storage format and a lot of the functions are provided by the GIS library. So the uh, coordinate geometry and the algorithms for figuring out things like relationships be between geometries comes from the geoff C++ library. Uh, you can see some of the methods that are available against geometry there and we actually will see these methods show up again later in the talk in SQL functions that I'll be talking about. Uh, the Proj4 library is used to handle map projections. So um, as non-GIS people, you're probably used to thinking of ge geographic information exclusively in terms of latitude and longitude coordinates. Uh, but that's not actually how you see GIS information. When you look at a map, uh, say a Google map, for example, that's, those are projection coordinates. The shapes you're seeing, seeing have been projected from latitude and longitude into the table. All the maps in Google are in the table projection. Um, if you look at a road map, it's probably some local projection for the city you're looking at. So map projections are used to present data which, you know, on a sphere, which lives on a sphere, but which we really interact with in a local area, which can be modeled much more comprehensively or much more reasonably on a plane. Uh, Google is a new dependency we have. Uh, it's primarily a raster library, and we're using it for the new raster type in uh, Postgres 2.0. So that allows us to store not just vector features, um, like polygon counts and points in the database, but also um, grid-based features. Things like that elevation map that I showed you is a raster data type. We can store rasters in the database in that way. And finally, we use libxml to handle input and output of some of the XML serialization in Postgres 2.0. So from a functionality point of view, um, so we've been around for 11 years or so. Um, the basic functionality was all done in year one. In fact, it was all done like month two. Um, we had a type and an index right away and released that. Um, version 0 0.5 gave us some basic analytic functions like distance and some standard serialization, things like well-known text and well-known binary. Um, 0 0.6, we started following an international standard called the uh, Simple Features in SQL standard. Uh, 0 0.7 began to get more tightly bound into Postgres itself. So things like selectivity calculation was built. So at that point, instead of getting brain-dead stupid plans when we ran complex SQL, we started getting reasonable plans. This is a plan that we could now tell the planner what to expect from our spatial indices. Um, we also added in Proj4 so we could do deprojection of the database. Uh, version 0 0.8 brought us up to full SS SQL support. So at that point, we were sort of feature 
comparable to the, uh, the proprietary alternatives, keep it comparable to Oracle, keep it comparable to what GDP had available. And since then, it's sort of all been uh, a progressive adding on of things beyond the standard that the users have wanted to have. Um, one of the things they required um, that's not in the standard was 4D support, so that came in 1.0. Um, the other thing was we started to experiment around 0 0.9 with um, different representations on the disk. So we've changed our disk representation twice in our uh, project history. The first time was at 1.0. The second time was at 2.0. Um, 1.1, linear referencing support, which is used a lot by departments of transportation for modeling highways. Uh, we began to move to new international standards, which eclipsed 1.2. So the ISO standard for spatial databases is called the PeopleNM Part 3 spatial standard, um, which means we support things like curves and whatnot, just linearly in situation information. And then things started to get, uh, get simple. So 1.2 was spent mostly with performance and stability work. Uh, 1.4 added some more performance around uh, predicates and unity geometry. And 1.5 added a spherical type uh, that allowed us to directly model latitude longitude coordinates. Um, so you could do calculations like tell me the distance between these two points, and it would give you an answer back in meters instead of degrees. 2.0 came out in April, so we have multi-dimensional support now. Um, we fully integrated geometry with the system catalog. So things like the uh, typology type of geometry and the spatial referencing geometry are now stored in the Postgres system catalog. It's made management of Postgres databases much more easy, much more simple. And instead of a question mark, uh, we actually did integrate rapidly with the system. Uh, I imagine the next version of Postgres will be Postgres XP, which I think will be very good. Perhaps we'll achieve 10 clicks, um, but I don't know if Postgres Vista is going to be as good as we hope. I, I predict there may be some downsides. So uh, what kind of organizations use Postgres? Really big ones, and surprisingly, really conservative ones, too. Um, there's nothing more conservative than a national mapping agency. Uh, EGN is the Institut Geographique National for France. They manage all the features in the nationwide map system uh, for France. Um, up to 2003, it was managed with files and GIS software. Uh, but they recognized for update purposes, they really needed to have a more modern system. Uh, they wanted to have it all in a central database. But what database to use? So they did a, did a database evaluation. Um, they looked at three possible databases, which are Postgres, DB2, and Oracle. And they asked um, a question of those databases, a couple questions. One, could it store their B to Uni national topographic base map? Uh, it had 100 million features then. It has about 200 million now. Um, and then could the database do transactions against those spatial objects? So you might want to make sure that the spatial objects weren't just some sort of crusty thing off to the side. They were, in fact, fully integrated in the database. And if they ran a commit, ran a set of transactions forward, they could stop at any point and back them out without having to cause any trouble with the underlying, underlying, underlying data. And the answer in all three cases were yes. Yes, yes, yes. So the, uh, the choice for them was obvious. Um, Postgres didn't cost them anything from a capital point of view. Even more important, they didn't have to go to a bid. So they could take what they already had. They'd already run prototypes against this. They could just take their prototype and keep on running with it without having to take six months out and actually run a competitive bid process around this system. Startup companies love Postgres. And they love using Postgres because it allows them to scale um, very, very cheaply. So here's an example. This is from a company from Seattle. Uh, Zonar Systems, they make vehicle tracking hardware on little, you can actually see a picture of it, little yellow boxes. Uh, mostly they're in school buses, but they're also in things like delivery seats, uh, Coca-Cola, waste management, have these little boxes stuck in their truck. And then they make software um, that maps, uh, maps the history of the fleet, so it keeps a long-running tally of where the fleet has gone. So locations come into the hardware, uh, they're piped over a GSM network, um, stored in Postgres, and then mapped um, using the map server open source rendering system into their web app. And uh, as the number of customers has gone up, the number of little yellow boxes has gone up, the amount of data flowing in has gone up. So they've gone from 1 to 10 to 50 to 100, several hundred of these Postgres entries. Um, if they had started and standardized on something like Oracle, their scaling costs would have been built in and they would have never gotten there. Google, surprising when they use Postgres, uh, not behind Google Maps. Uh, they use it as a metadata system. So they have a pile, unbelievable piles of data flowing in to their data management uh, department. And they use Postgres 
to manage the metadata about what data they have, what state it's in, in their uh, you know, processing system, and what they need to do to get it fully processed and out to the things like things like Snap and Google Earth and things like that. Uh, Redfin is another startup. They're a real estate startup. They uh, started with MySQL um, as a web company. I think they started with, with MySQL. But when they put Spatial in it, they found that they really could not run Spatial queries effectively in, uh, in MySQL. It was just too slow. Basically, as soon as they got anything more complex than a single table query, the performance fell down. Um, so they moved to PostGIS and then PostgreSQL, and things got much better. Um, because PostGIS is integrated to the PostGIS planner, we can plan things properly and get the right answers out. And finally, um, more and more of the mobile companies, the folks who are putting the apps on these phones that we're carrying around in our pockets that tell them where we are all the time. Um, so Map My Fitness is an example. They built a mobile health application. Uh, they use PostGIS on the back end to store the, uh, the location that you send them about your running map. So, um, so that's you know theory. That's a little bit of history. That's who's using it. Um, so how does it work? Um, what does it look like as an end user, as a as a data as database people? Um, so PostGIS is a database type extension. Um, so it has representations of uh, of the new type. Um, it's got indexes to make searches on that representation really fast, and it's got functions that make sense of that type. And, uh, and on top of it all, you can build applications that take the data out of the database and answer questions or show information to you. So all the geographic objects are stored in the database using simplified reduction equations, right? You can't, you can't store a house, right? There's no such idea as a house for the database. What you can store is a shape that represents that house. A, you can store a sequence of numbers that represents where this house is. And that sequence of numbers is stored in the geometry type. But um, the geometry is a very, abstract term, right? It doesn't say much about how we're going to represent the objects in the table. So what we do is we specialize geometry with a type modifier. Um, and we use one of the types defined by the Open Geospatial Network. So these are the guys who define the standards for how you represent the geometry in a, in a database. So we could say our geometry is a point, like on a graph for a fire hydrant, and it could be a line string, like a road or a stream or a flight path, or it could be a polygon in a covered area, like a parcel or a municipal boundary or a lake. Um, and the representations of those objects, these objects are all based on linear interpolation from the universe. So um, they're all objects that look kind of like these polygons, right? This has you know, eight coordinates in an ordered ring with linear interpolation between the coordinates. But it actually turns out that linear interpolation is the only way to describe a path. And ISO added in their people MM specification types for circular string, compound curve, and curve polygons. And they're different from the, from the simpler ones in that they use circular arc interpolation. So a circular arc is defined by a triplet of coordinates, whereas the linear representation is just defined by a pair. Um, each triplet defines a unique arc segment of a circle. So the isotypes can smoothly represent objects like full circles or cul-de-sacs or just you know, very gently curving, smooth things. Um, any three points defines a unique circle and a, un a unique segment of it. And both ISO and OGC specifications include um, collections. So you can have not just a point, but you could have a multi-point, or not just a curve, but a multi-curve, multi-polygon. These are single um, rows in the database that represent um, more than one of the simple objects. And recently, OGC has been working on uh, follow-up standard single graph for FS3.2, and they've added some 3D objects, um, things like triangles, uh, TINs, that's a GIS term that stands for triangulated irregular network, looks like a net, um, and then polyhedral surfaces. And what good's a polyhedral surface? Those guys. You might use a polyhedral surface to store one of those. Um, building models are a classic use for polyhedral surfaces. So we have a representation. So now we can create columns that are constrained to specific types um, and to specific map projections. So the magic number back here in pink is map projection. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's really obscure. Um, now we have representations. The next thing we need to do is be able to quickly search to do fast random access to those representations. Now, unlike numbers, strings, and dates, geometry can't be sorted along a single axis. Like, you can take, give you a, a bucket full of numbers, right? You can lay them all out, and they'll all out, lay out in one line. Give you a bucket full of dates, and they'll do the same thing. Um, but if I give you a bucket full of points, you can't really do that. I mean, you can pick an arbitrary 
linear ordering of them. So there's no guarantee that you'll be able to, that you'll get a nice um, homogeneous collection. You'll get bumps and so on. Um, what you need is something which can actually index these things across the domain they live in, which is for two-dimensional things, for two-dimensional planes. So Postgres has implemented an R tree on top of the, uh, the GIF index method API. So to create a, a 2D R tree index using the default geometry option operation in the view GIF syntax, pretty straightforward stuff. If you wanted a, an n-dimensional index, if you have three or 40 objects, you would use this index set syntax down here. Um, it only differs in that you specify the op class, a different op class. So there's actually two op classes for geometry, the two-dimensional op class and the n-dimensional op class. And it just happens that the two-dimensional op class is the default one, so you don't have to specify it. And then to do queries using the indexes, you just use an index operator. So for the 2D index, the index operator is the ampersand ampersand. And for the ND index, it's the triple ampersand. Um, for common spatial functions, um, like S and intersect chains and U within, to make it easier for our users, we don't necessarily want to think about the difference between an index op versus just a functional um, Boolean predicate. We've actually inlined the index calls into the function, so you don't have to write them out. They just implicitly are in there. Um, so which gets, brings me to functions. So we've got representations. We've got indexes on those representations for fast access. Now we need functions that work against those representations to do stuff. Um, there's over 300 different functions. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about 20. Uh, and they can be broken down into a few categories. So um, input-output functions, descriptive functions, comparative functions, and structured functions. Uh, the input-output functions are used to convert from external representations of geometry, and there's surprisingly a lot of those, um, to the geometry object in the database, and vice versa. So the input and output functions, they tend to, they, they actually do, they share a syntactic pattern. Uh, the input functions are stgeom from something, and the outputs are st as the thing you want. So on the input side, we can read from GML and KML and GeoJSON, a uh, well-known text and well-known binary are OGC um, defined standard representations, uh, text representations, and binary schemes. And then we can write out to GML and KML and SVG, S3D for the new 3D object, GeoJSON and the web app, and then the OGC well-known text and well-known binary. So lots of input-output op options. Descriptive functions let you characterize a single geometry object in some way. So given a geometry object, um, you could measure it right, get like the length um, or the area. Um, or maybe you could look into a geometry, and these can be complex objects, right? Um, polygons consist of a number of rings. You can have rings on the outside and the rings on the inside, which represent the holes in the geometry. So you might want to ask, you know, how many rings do you have in your polygon? Or, oh, you have more than one? I want your interior ring. Give me, give me this harsh part of yourself. Give me ring N. Um, or you can see, you run a function that characterizes an object, like a, like a geohash. So given a geometry object, strip it down to a string P that, uh, that tells you kind of where it is. So using functions like that, you can imagine answering questions like, you know, how big is Yosemite Park? Or how long is the Golden Gate Bridge? But, uh, but all, those funct all these simple um, descriptive functions have in common. They work on one geometry at a time. The really interesting functions, um, are the comparative functions. And they take in two geometries, and they tell you about their relationships. And these are the really powerful ones. Now, this return true or false, depending on whether spatial relationships exist in the set. So intersect the return true if two geometries have a spatial interaction, or any interaction at all, um, on the boundaries or the interiors. Um, and then it has a, an opposite. So if SD intersect is true, then SD disjoint is false, and vice versa. Um, SD touches are subtle little functions. They return true when the boundaries of two objects interact, uh, but nothing else. So neighboring parcels, say, in a city, they return true for touching. Um, within is a complete schema check. So an object has to be completely inside the exterior of the other object to pass the within check. And within has a complementary function for chaining. So if A is, A is within B, then B contains A. Almost the same in name, but very different in function, SDB within returns true when A and B are within R distance of one another. Uh, the implementation of SDB within uses the fact um, 
that it has both the object and the distance's parameters, and it builds an index-optimized version of the query. Uh, so you, you can write the same thing logically with, with SD distance. SD distance less than R is logically the same as SDD within with the same parameters. But SDD within will always return faster because it has an implicit index built in under, underneath it. And of course, you could just call SD distance the simple SD distance itself. All these are about relationships. Um, so that's a quick tour of the relationship functions. We'll see in a second why they're so powerful. But first, uh, the constructive functions. Constructive functions take in geometries or arguments, and they build whole new geometries. Uh, they're the kind of functions that, that make GIS people sort of quiver with desire. Uh, they really love this stuff. Um, like the buffer function, uh, GIS people love buffering things. The buffer function sort of inflates geometries like a balloon. Uh, it expands their boundaries by distance, or if you use a negative distance, it shrinks them down to a smaller object, or if the negative distance is small enough, it actually makes them disappear entirely. Uh, you can do an intersection. So given two geometries, the intersection of the plane is the part that they both have in common. So in this case, the intersection is another area. But actually, if the polygon only shared a boundary, the intersection would be a line, the boundary line. Or if it only touches a point, the intersection would be just the point where they touch. Difference, this takes the spatial area of one geometry away from the other one. So like a, an area of interaction. And then union creates a new geometry that covers all the spatial area as the two inputs. And, and that's mighty cool, but because it's a two-valued function, it's not nearly as useful um, or as used as often as the aggregate version of SD distance, which takes a set of geometries and returns a single geometry that covers the whole area of the input. And GIS people really love this one because it can do what they call dissolves. Um, so that's what it's called in the old software. You can do dissolves, you can do it in SQL. So for example, you can take uh, this set of census blocks for New York City and dissolve them using just one simple SQL statement. This uh, groups the blocks by the first five digits of the block ID number. Uh, and the first five digits of the block ID number correspond to each county that each block is in. So if you dissolve them and group by the block, by that, by that new ID, what you get back is a new set of states, which is the county boundary, but based on the input block. Uh, that's not the only um, aggregate function for geometry. Uh, for folks running those fleet tracking operations, there's a very handy aggregate function, uh, the make line function. It takes in an ordered set of points and outputs a line string, which is really great. You take a set of time-stamped GPS locations, flip them into lines, they can map them out into nice mappable lines. It's great for display. So that's not even 10% of the functions, but it gives you kind of a flavor um, of what I mean when I say input-output descriptive comparative construct constructive functions. But um, so that's sort of like, like all the features, right? Um, so what? Who cares about all those little functions? Uh, what can you do as a SQL developer with that functionality? So the really powerful part about having spatial in your toolbox is it opens up like a whole extra dimension of logic that you can apply to your business questions. Um, because it lets you leverage uh, what the geographers call Tobler's Law of Geography, which loosely says that things that are near to each other are more similar than things that are far apart. Or putting it um, statistically, you know, spatial autocorrelation is really kind of what it is. It's the rule, not the exception. And once you accept that, that things that are near each other share attributes, um, you've got access to a whole powerful new path of data integration. Um, because you can, because location is the universal key for joining unrelated information. I gave it my name, actually. I first heard it told. I should, I should say it's Davis's law because my colleague Mark Davis is the one who put this bug into me with the idea. Location is the universal key. Like we're used to explicit keys in our data models, right? Primary key to foreign key. And how do I test that these, how do I put these tables to, together? It's an exact match, right? The primary key exactly matches the foreign key and I can put those rows together. But location gives you a new kind of loose key that you can use to add extra information to your data that's not explicitly joined, right? Suppose you have a huge customer database, right? You have millions of customers, and you've got their addresses data coded. Like, suppose you're Walmart, right? And suppose that for marketing purposes, you want to know the income and the education level of your customers. You're not going to get that from point of sale records, right? Um, you could run a survey, but that would be expensive, and it would also be duplicative. Because a survey has already been run. Like, a huge, expensive survey has already been run. It's called the US Census. Um, but your customer information doesn't have a foreign key linking it to census tracts. 
So how are you going to get that census information onto your customer record? You use the universal key, right? Location. Every customer has a location, so the location falls within a census tract. So you can join the customer to the census using a spatial relationship provision, something like this. Right? This spits out a new table that adds census attributes to each customer. And they can take that census information, type it into statistical analysis, maybe you've loaded PLR into your database, um, and get a statistical analysis of your customer. That's pretty simple stuff, right? Eight words in SQL. And yet, you're joining two completely different databases. So once you add the spatial dimension to your models, you've access to like this whole range of new analysis options. Um, and they're harder to ask to access with a strictly non-spatial model. The kinds of questions you can ask here, like they're really only limited by the data you can generate. What city, what state, what ward, what market, what watershed? What is, you know, all these things. What, what are these, where's my address, right? You can answer all these questions once you have those layers in there. So how do you build these spatial applications? Um, I've been still, I've been talking about SQL and numbers here, but how do we get out of the database into the real world of applications? That's pretty mad. Um, so practically, you know, you're going to need to install it first. Um, I'd suggest you get PostgreSQL 9.1 or better and PostgreSQL 2 or better. Um, it gives you the easiest to install story and the latest features. Um, for Debian, there is a Debian GIS project um, which pushes out um, packages, although I don't know if they're up to date on 2.0. Red Hat, uh, the yum.postgresql.org site has the most up to date stuff and it's really easy to install using the dbdb build that Devrin Gun does. does. Uh, for Windows, you can get pre-built binaries from the postgres.org site directly. And for Mac OS X, uh, Heroku has recently released a really handy tool um, for developers, postgresapp.com. Simple drag it into your applications folder install of Postgres. It also includes Postgres, so very useful for Flint. Once you've installed the software, spatializing any existing database is just, is now really trivial, right? You just run create extension Postgres as super user. Uh, create the actual create key function, and boom, your data, your database is now spatially managed. Okay, so you got data, you got uh, Postgres installed. What's next? To build a spatial application, um, you need spatial data. Often, because you're starting with non-spatial inputs, you might need geocoding or reverse geocoding. Uh, you're gonna need some kind of mapping toolkit on the front end so you can see the maps, and sometimes you'll need a rendering engine in the application view of your larger data set. Data can be hard to find, I admit, for folks that are new to the GIS world. Um, but over the last few years, the open data movement has really provided a lot of new, um, easier portals to finding geodata. So in the states, federally, you've got geo.data.gov. And the census, as always, just continues to publish really high, high quality, um, very finely, finely grained maps um, from the use of the census, the roads, the tracks themselves. Water features are in there. Points of interest features are in there. Um, there's global and regional over, overview data at naturalearth.org. Geonames.org is a great site for getting uh, point of interest places. Here in Canada, geogratis.ca sort of fills the same role as geo.data.gov. And then depending on your jurisdiction, you might find that your city, your county, or your state also has an open data portal, and they will have more finely grained data than you might get from a federal or whole world site um, that you can bring into your app. And finally, you can just go to Google, right? and type in the thing you're interested in um, plus shapefile. Because shapefile is sort of the lingua franca for sharing um, GIS data. And, and see if it comes up. Once you've got a shapefile, loading it into the database isn't that hard. Um, Postgres gives you a command line tool and some GUI tools for importing shapefiles into spatial tables. Each shapefile is a layer in GIS world, so it, so, so it corresponds to a table in database world. Um, and if you have a, a different format, not a shapefile format, so like a KML file or something even weirder like a mapping profile, uh, there's a tool called OGR to OGR that handles probably uh, 16 or, or 17 different odder, stranger formats you might run into in shapefiles. And you can load those directly into Postgres using OGR to OGR, which is part of the Google library. Now, so you've gathered some external data, that's great. Um, you might want to make your business data spatial. So probably you've got address information on your records. So to get into the spatial world, you're gonna want to geocode it. So that's the act of taking the implicit location that resides in a text string, because all an address is is a text string, right? Um, and turning it into an actual coordinate, a physical location in the room. 
So there's online services for that, like Google and Bing. You go there, they have geocoding APIs. The web services, you can pump your addresses up into the geocoding APIs and get point locations back. Uh, but there are license restrictions, both on how many things you can put through those engines and, uh, and what you can do with the locations once you get them back. Uh, if you don't want restrictions, you could use Postgres's included geocoder. Uh, in our Exodus directory, we have a geocoder that works against the uh, US Census Tiger data. So good for those of you who are in the continental US. Reverse geocoding is the reverse of geocoding. <laughs> it takes in a precise spatial coordinate and returns a string. Usually it's an address string. Um, we often see reverse geocoders used in apps that want to display the current address of the map or the cursor that you're hovering over the, uh, of the map. Once you've got your data spatial coordinates, you probably want to put it on the map. So you can use a commercial JavaScript map API like Google or Bing, or you could use an open source JavaScript map like OpenLayers or Leaflets. Um, OpenLayers.org and Leaflets and the custom plugins that we use are probably are both very good maps for this problem. So to get your data onto a web map, what you'll do is you'll push uh, your input query parameters through an HTTP script of some sort, HTTP, Perl, whatever, and Python, uh, and into a SQL query of the sort we saw later, but maybe with an output type of JSON or XML to pass the answer back to the JavaScript map which can then parse it and draw it on top. So that's really, that's suitable for doing all sorts of, of fun little tricks. So you got a web page, now you've got a map, thanks to the mapping API. Now you can get your business data on top and ask questions based on clicks on that map. So, you know, use a simple web architecture with a front end and your scripts to the database and you answer all kinds of fun questions like click, what's the nearest hotel to the place I just clicked? Or click, what city am I in on the basis of my click? Or click, what's the demographic profile in a radius of my click? or uh, click and add a piece of information at the place I just clicked. So that works well for relatively small business data, um, but sometimes the things you want to show on the map are going to be too big to transfer over the wire. You know, if you have 500,000 points, you can't transfer them over the wire. Um, and if, even if you did transfer them over the wire, asking JavaScript to render them directly into the map would crush your user's web browser. Um, or you might want to style the things that you're sending over the map in more complex ways than you can do with the mapping API. Um, or in addition to putting things on the web, you might also want to pr publish your data using uh, an international standard web service API, like the OGP web map service or the web user server. And there are open source engines that let you do that. Um, so what you do is you put a spatial application server in front of your database, uh, an engine like Map Server or Jupyter Server or the OpenGL Suite, um, all of which are available from the corresponding .org sites. And what these engines do is they take in raw data from the database, and they apply some complex rendering rules, and they output map images or map tiles that can be then displayed in those web map interfaces like Google and Bing and OpenLayers. Um, in addition to doing that, so you can do your website, um, they also publish standards-based access to the services um, or to, to the, either to the rendering services or to the XML feature suite using things like Web Feature Service and Web Map Server. So we've covered representations and indexes and functions and applications. You know, there's hours more stuff, you know, that we can cover. But really, one of the fanciest things that you can do with Postgres, uh, all the fancy things you can do with Postgres, and the, and the ones which I love talking to GIS people about these being built, because they go, wow, really, you can do that? Um, they're all attributes not of Postgres, but of PostgresQL. Um, because, you know, the real power is not Postgres in and of itself, it's Postgres combined with the amazing stuff that's already in PostgreSQL. So replication and partitioning, um, the access to array types, the fact that you have a full text searching engine sitting next to your GIS engine means you can build really powerful apps. Um, the fact that you can build procedural programs or procedural programs with crazy languages like R, right? So you can build something which does a full text search to pull out geospatial data that gets typed into R and does spatial statistics on it all within the same environment. Subqueries, constraints, triggers, these are all data management features we take for granted in the database world, but, uh, but in the spatial world, these in the GIS world, these are, ooh, ah, this is amazing, this is amazing stuff. Um, but now you guys need to read up too, right? Because it's not just us spatial folks coming into the database world. The spatial world is coming to you really quickly, right? Because it's invading the database. Location is just baked in to all the interactions that you're developing with your customer. If you're talking with the customer on your phone, not only do you know what they're telling you, but oftentimes you know where they are. So 
we're doing our jobs as database people now, we should be being aware that location is coming in all the time and making sure we're saving it and then using the tools available like Postgres to query on it and analyze it. Um, this is Postgres. We go to 11. Thank you very much. So I've got a couple minutes uh, before coffee. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, okay, so the question is how precise does a Tiger uh, geocoder get? So as with all geocoders, it's precise to the data. Um, the good news is the census data is really precise. So they have, within the bounds of when the census is run um, and their updates to their network, they have the whole street name. So every street is there. Um, for every street, they have the start and end address. So if you give you know an address of 54 Main Street, what the geocoder does is it looks and finds Main Street and then it puts it 54% of the way along. And then based on the um, even or odd, it will also offset it slightly one way or the other. So it's, it's precise. It's not accurate. Because uh, houses are not evenly distributed between their endpoints. When you get into a rural area, particularly you know, the, the, you know, the roads are long and sinuous. They have start endpoints, but there's no way the houses are homogeneously distributed along that. Um, so it's pretty damn good. It's the input for all three. So, um, first of all, note that you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> you can, at this point, uh, Postgres has become a sufficiently important standard in GIS world that all of the desktop apps that people work on geocoders with now support Postgres as backend storage. So they can store their data in Postgres and keep using our computing and GIS tools. Um, there are open source uh, equivalents to, uh, to things like ArcGIS on the desktop. Uh, Puget pgis.org is the one that's most well known, and, and the one that's most well developed. Um, anyone who looks at a few will automatically say, Whoa. you know, the fit and finish on Puget is not as good. It doesn't do as much stuff. So it really depends on what is their use case, what are they actually doing with it. Um, the reality is if you've already got desktop tools that they like, it might be better just to say, hey, I'm using those tools. Let's just swap out the back end so they have a little more flexibility than other projects. a lot.